Hello, uh, my name is Mark Newey. I'm an artist uh, and cartoonist living in Windsor, Ontario, and I made the comic, 12-page uh, comic called Welcome to D-Double Dub for uh, Future Present at the Science Gallery, the exhibition now going on in uh, downtown Detroit. Um, Welcome to D-Double Dub is a comic that I made. It's, uh, it's a utopian vision for the region, and it's... Uh, it's part of a larger project that, I, that I'm working on, kind of a larger drawing project, ongoing drawing project called Future Parfait. And Future Parfait is a, it's an attempt to tr try to imagine a better world for us, like a, trying to um, take elements of the present day and kind of like our current best practices and civilization um, and put them all together and extrapolate them into the future so that uh, in order to kind of paint a more uh, and a very optimistic uh, vision, uh, something I think is important right now. It feels like uh, as a culture that we are kind of lacking in these visions or lacking in a kind of a more coherent narratives about how uh, we can make a better world. Uh, it's like <clears throat> dystopia is all around us right now. Um, it's, you know, authoritarians, climate change, it gross economic inequity just everywhere all the time and uh, it can feel very uh, oppressive so future parfait is a is a way of um, it's a way of countering that narrative and trying to come up with some stories that we can work towards I think uh, it's really important for people to have you know stories about how they're gonna succeed what that success looks like so we can kind of emotionally uh, move towards them and, you know, make decisions that get us there and, and be motivated to get us there. So that's, that's, yeah, that's what Future Parfait is. And so welcome to D-Double Dub. Um, yeah, 12 page comic. You can download it from this workshop site. Uh, if you haven't read it, I think it's probably a good idea to read it. It probably takes about 20 minutes. There's a lot of words. Uh, I mean, a lot of new concepts. It's very wordy. Um, but think of it as sort of like a recipe. Not, it's not really a story. It's more of a recipe or a kind of a, the results of a thought experiment. It's a world building exercise. Um, so yeah, if you haven't read it, I would say download it and read it now. And then um, I will, the next, um, and then I will uh, go through kind of how I made it. That's, that's what this workshop is about, is how that comic was made and how I, uh, um, yeah, how, how I came to sort of imagine the world of Welcome to D Double Dub. So, uh, so let me start with where I'm coming from, a little bit about who I am and my background and my story. Um, I think it'll give you give you a good idea of yeah where I'm coming from. So I'm a, I'm an artist cartoonist and I live in Windsor. My name is Mark Newey. I uh, went to architecture school. Well, let's start with this. I was a kid who never stopped drawing. You know how as a kid you start drawing and uh, a lot of times, you know, other things come up and you maybe stop drawing, you take up sports or whatever, you get into other things. But I was a kid who started drawing, you know, the age of whenever kids start drawing and never stopped. I had a great uh, a great librarian, I would say, as a, in, in elementary school who sort of coached me through making a book like kind of emulating a storybook that was in the library. So I wrote my own version of it. I, I wrote it, I drew it, and essentially got hooked on visual storytelling at that point, probably the age of seven. I never stopped. I went to architecture school. Uh, it seemed like a kind of a, a rational thing to do after high school because it's sort of, I was strong in the sciences, I was strong in art, and architecture was one of those uh, careers that seemed to incorporate both. I loved architecture school. It was a great education. And uh, one of the things I learned about art, about architecture while I was in architecture school is that I don't want to be an architect. I mean, I love the way, I love the design thinking. I love the critical thinking. I love the, the big picture systems thinking that uh, is involved with architecture. But the profession was some, the profession was something else entirely. It was very mediated. And the type of creativity I was attracted to, you know, was about, would be like 5% of the actual project time you spent making a building as an architect. Like I was interested in the real, in the conceptual stuff, the fantastic stuff. 
I was always designing buildings that couldn't be built, essentially. Uh, so after I got my architecture degree, I fell into the world of comics and cartooning, back to that first love as a child, and uh, spent a lot of time kind of honing that craft, like learning how to tell a story visually, you know, the, the, the conventions of comic storytelling, and uh, just made a lot of comics, like maybe spent 10 years in that world, just drawing, drawing fast, drawing hard, you know, making a lot of uh, zines and self-published books. I eventually got a couple of graphic novels published, made these connections in the world. And uh, yeah, so I, I did that for about uh, 10 years. And then, and at the time, kind of right about the end of that period, I was living in Toronto and uh, it was about the mid Audis, so like 2005. And by that point, I you, I had also become something what you might call an apocalypse nerd. Just sort of obsessed with all these kind of end of the world scenarios. Like if you remember 2000, there was the Y2K bug, which was going to, you know, destroy all of our computers and, you know, wipe out civilization. Then there was SARS, the avian flu. Uh, that also felt fairly apocalyptic in that period. And and that was just around the time that climate change was like the information from the scientists was becoming really harrowing. They had uh, around 2005, 2006 was the first point where you'd read reports about how the global, uh, the Arctic, the Arctic ice masses would be uh, melted, you know, in a, in, a, in a century. So there would be no frozen water in the, in the summers up there and what you know and then when you think about the implications what that means is like you know flooding sea level rise all kinds of things and so around the mid-2000s everything seemed really dire and i was just sort of obsessed with it um and so the story of future parfait is kind of how i got out of that like apocalypse nerddom and there were a couple couple of things couple important things uh, one was at that point my partner and i a fellow artist and co-conspirator in making making stuff, uh, Magda, uh, we decided we were going to sell all our things, sell all of our things, and um, go traveling. Like just basically hit the road, uh, get mobile, kind of get ready for this kind of coming apocalypse by being light on our feet. At the time, uh, high speed internet was just kind of finding its way to the furthest corners of the world. Like uh, so, we were able to take our freelance work, illustration and websites, and basically just travel. We ended up traveling for about six years, uh, going to Central America, Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, India, and uh, kind of all over North America, including Mexico and uh, the United States, Canada. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> spent a lot, like uh, that was about six years of being on the road and kind of absorbing things and uh, over the course of say about the last I would say about 10 years or so I've I've come around I've, I've sort of changed my ideas about this you know you know we're all headed for doom or like this sense of apocalypse and uh, there are a couple of things that were sort of really important uh, for for that understanding for me and I'm going to just talk about those few things uh, now first was the travel uh, the second was a podcast by a uh, uh, an author called Paul Hawken. He's I'll, I'll talk to more talk more about this in subsequent sections. The the third was um, also kind of coming uh, learning about certain aspects of our mind, kind of uh, psychological aspects. Something called the negativity bias, which is kind of a neurological um, feature, say, of our brain. And um, other other kind of concepts that sort of were helpful in in helpful for me to frame the negativity and just kind of understand it, kind of corral it, and sort of recognize that uh, these the sense of doom or apocalypse was sort of a, as much of a kind of a cultural and emotional product. It wasn't necessarily what was going on or you know the truth of the world. So the first part in the kind of the development of Future Parfait, which is this project to imagine a, a more kind of utopian, a very radically optimistic view of the future. Uh, the first part was like uh, overcoming this kind of deep pessimism that you can you can get just by observing the world and um, <clears throat> getting overwhelmed by all the bad news, let's say, and also by the uh, 
dystopias. Like, if you've noticed, there are very few utopias in culture, like, or, you know, um, ideal places. Like, all of, all of our kind of imagining for the future, like the Matrix or, um, you know, countless uh, countless sci-fi movies, is that we, we're kind of... It's it's a kind of an expression of all the the horribleness of today, but projected into the future. So that um, I think that that is a that's it shouldn't be underestimated. Like when you're bombarded with these ideas constantly, like they get into your mind, and they affect your outlook. So I decided I needed to take what I might call like a radically optimistic view of the world, like sort of counter some of these innate tendencies to think negatively or be influenced by existing culture. To think negatively um, and you could say there's like maybe four things I want to talk about in terms of you know what helped me come to optimism what helped me develop a radical optimism the first one was the travel oh uh, we started travel kind of like a almost uh, not quite but kind of like in a panic like oh gosh everything's melting down we're gonna have to like Everything's about to change forever, and so let's just get mobile, let's stay loose, let's stay light, and let's stay on top of this uh, coming apocalypse. Um, but what I found, actually, what we found uh, when we were traveling is that, you know, humans are generally just basically good people. They're just like, uh, the, you, you know, you, there are people you meet who want to, who might want to do you harm or exploit you or something, but for the most part, the majority of humans are kind and compassionate and they they want to help they want to be um you know they go out of their way to be friendly like it, it we all know the feeling like when you're when you're kind and compassionate it gives back to you, you that sense of being generous is actually a, a it's like a it's like a benefit unto itself the emotional feedback of that so traveling the world, visiting cultures, and kind of coming to an understanding of like a baseline human decency, like a baseline human compassion. Like um, even as a first world person traveling, you know, to developing countries or countries that are, you know, have more poverty, um, you do get a sense that you're operating in privilege and that, you know, certain pe people will, will recognize that and see like, well, what can they get out of you because you have so much more just by sheer you know, uh, luck of being born somewhere else. So that, um, understanding that, I guess, and understanding like the, uh, the, the socio-political forces that might cause someone to think that you're, you know, a tourist <clears throat> or, you know, treat you a certain way for that reason. Um, that's, that's sort of understandable. And that's kind of part of the big, big picture and the, and the system that is sort of, we're working against, uh, as we try to imagine positive futures. So you could say that traveling uh, was very eye-opening and it was like a it was like a first first hand um, first hand experience of the kind the general kindness and compassion of people. Like that's um, <clears throat> that was uh, an important lesson. The second uh, one, the second point was I'd listened to a podcast at some point. Um, it was called "Blessed Unrest," and it was it was a it was a Long Now seminar. Um, the Long Now Foundation is based in San Francisco, and they're it's, a, it's sort of like a it's a group that is really tries to promote the idea of long term thinking, like that's as as a means of sort of making a better world. Uh, like they're the kind of the main idea is that a lot of our culture now is really focused on short-term thinking, like a profit next year's profit next quarter, you know, um, and kind of in the space of a single lifetime, what am I going to accomplish? What am I as an individual going to get out of this life? Whereas, uh, long now foundation and, you know, countless other groups too, you could say, uh, particularly, uh, maybe indigenous groups and the way indigenous groups think a lot, they're um, thinking about long term. So, like, uh, what are what you know? What is going to happen in seven generations? How are my actions today going to affect the course of you know life for someone, my grandchildren or great grandchildren? So, uh, to that end, they do they do kind of a monthly, a regular podcast. And so, there was this one podcast with uh, uh, with an author, Paul Hawken, and uh, he had, I think had just written the book. Called Blessed Unrest, 
So the entire so Paul Hawkins' work at that point was trying to look at um, social justice movements, eco, eco justice movements in the world, and like NGOs, and to get to try to come to a quantitative sense of like who's out there, who's doing what, what's happening, like um, what is the scale of this work. And uh, if you listen to the podcast, which you should, I'll put a link to it at the uh, kind of at the notes at the end of this workshop. Um, he came to the conclusion that he was kind of blown away, like, you know, hundreds of millions of people um, working in organizations that are all dedicated to sort of the same principles, the same idea of kind of like equality and uh, justice and human rights and kind of ecological responsibility um so uh for him it was a it was a powerful moment i think based on that podcast and, and he was able to translate that so it's like as much as we can look at the news which is totally obsessed with kind of negative news because that's what our brains attach to that's what our minds gravitate towards that's what we tune into just it's uh i'll get to that next that's the negativity bias but once you get over that uh, media bias for like doom and gloom, and you start looking at kind of the the number of people and the types of projects, just the quality and the scale of these activities is is quite overwhelming. Like, and it's it's really heartening. It's really really comforting to know that that is happening in the world. So uh, I highly recommend uh, listening to that. It's called Blessed Unrest. It's it's uh, a long now foundation seminar and uh, a link to it uh, uh, at the end of this workshop. The next thing, uh, there's two more concepts that really helped me uh, come to optimism. One is <clears throat> called the negativity bias. And the negativity bias is a, um, I'm going to just read the Wikipedia uh, definition here because it's, so, it's just concise. It works well. The negativity bias, also known as a negativity effect, is the notion that things of a more negative nature, for example, unpleasant thoughts, emotions, social interactions, or harmful or traumatic events, ha have a greater effect on one's psychological state and processes than neutral or positive things. In other words, something very positive will generally have less of an impact on a person's behavior and cognition than something equally emotional but negative. The implications of the negativity bias or kind of understanding like that it exists or I think are quite profound. It gives you a tool to sort of understand like if your mind is spinning out in uh, sort of visions of doom and gloom or if you become obsessed with the worry that uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's it's like a it's like a hard wiring. It's sort of like there's a, there's a psych, there's a neurological uh, mechanism that is sort of keeping you in that loop. That is sort of um, it uh, it's keeping you there because kind of from an evolutionary standpoint, your body wants to survive. You you want to preserve yourself. So this 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 type of knowledge you know stays in the forefront of your mind because it it helps you stay alive. However, you know uh, I think. You could say that you know humans have sort of created a different environment now in which to uh, live, and that some of these uh, neurological um, modes and systems are might lead us awry at a certain point. Like if we get we get stuck in these visions of negativity, and I think that you could say um, culture is in that position right now. Um, it's really it's a uh, like. There, you, you can find examples of utopias in stories and movies and media, but it's really not what sells. It's not what attracts our attention. It's not what draws our attention. Our minds uh, and our attention are drawn to things that are, you could say, are negative or threats. So, but once you have that understanding, you can kind of, you know, once you, you can kind of skip over that part. You can sort of, um, with, with some mindfulness and some intentionality, um, you can you can sort of mentally bypass that negativity bias and just just say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm just not gonna uh, think about that stuff right now. I'm gonna focus on other things like you know positive visions. 
So I, I find the ne understanding the negativity bias is a really helpful concept for uh, cultivating a radical optimism. Another really useful concept uh, that is relatively new to me, but I think is quite um, uh, powerful in terms of coming to optimism is uh, it's called capitalist realism. And uh, capitalist realism uh, was, comes from a book by a philosopher named uh, Mark Fisher, a British guy. And uh, it um, was published in 2009. And the basic premise is that um, this sort of world that we live in, kind of the socio-economical uh, systems that we live in, um, that they, uh, they, they kind of create the illusion that that's all there is. That's the only thing possible. Like we are raised, you know, our education, the whole uh, work environment are sort of like, they've been developed over the course of, you know, you could say millennia uh, to sort of, to create this culture in which uh, the idea of say capitalism um, is, the, is the only, only option. It's like, and then when, you know, there are attempts to rectify it, like say like the, you know, the revolutions of the early uh, 20th century, um, th these, these projects always kind of fail or fall short or fall into the same traps that, that, you know, capitalism has become trapped in this sort of idea of authority and hierarchy and power. So um, that's another useful concept. It's just like the negativity bias, but on kind of a cultural level like the, the idea that everything that we learn, everything that we're kind of taught in sort of mainstream media is meant to kind of preserve the status quo. And it's meant to, uh, to and as a result, it, uh, it ends up limiting our imaginations. Like we think like, oh, what's this? It's never, like, there's no option. We have to kind of operate in this, in this structure. We have to accept it and make the best of it. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's just not true. Um, you can, you think like, what might a serf, you know, in the middle ages have thought about Roman, about Christianity or, you know, the, the feudal system, the idea, or would they have even be able to comprehend democracy if they hadn't say read the Greeks? Um, so the idea of a capitalist reality and kind of um, understanding that the actual uh, kind of media environment that we find ourselves in, that we create for ourselves, um, promotes this idea that there's no option. It kind of it basically stifles the imagination. And that's, uh, that's pretty damaging. And I think it's, uh, once you, but once you have an idea that this is the case and this is, this is how uh, those larger forces are working, then you can, again, just kind of step out of it. Like, um, counter it in your mind like okay what is the opposite like this like just sort of drop these um internal shackles let's say um about you know <clears throat> how how, you, how we believe things must be or ought to be or can only be uh when in fact um it feels like once you once you drop these shackles uh a lot more is possible and that uh that's what's going to keep you moving forward and towards these brighter futures so the next step is figuring out like what is actually possible once you get over all the, the negativity biases and kind of the sense that, uh, you know, it's all doom and gloom and there's no hope. Um, and then you move, get to this point of like, wow, well, there's, you know, there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful and, uh, and what is possible, like how, how, how to cultivate an informed optimism so that it's not just, I say what you call like a Pollyanna where you're just kind of hopelessly idealistic and not really facing the facts. Um, so in terms of coming to like an informed optimism, I think there are several useful concepts as well. Um, the first one is the idea of symbiosis in evolution and, uh, and its implications for, you know, human nature and um, our tendency to cooperate. Symbiosis is when two organisms kind of work together or, or rely on each other to survive. It could be uh, mutual or it could be parasitic, but either way, both creatures need each other to survive. And this is a, uh, this is a really kind of fundamental aspect of life and the success of life. Like um, there was a, a scientist, Lynn Margulis, who proposed that, you know, our 
like multicellular organisms or even cells themselves are the products of symbiosis. Like you would have protocellular structures like mitochondria and, uh, you know, uh, RNA. Like they weren't, they were individual kind of, you know, replicating entities at one point, you know, like the many viruses or bacteria, but somehow they found their way into like the cell, into a single membrane and started to work together and created this, you know, uh, kind of a living cell, a, a kind of a, a, a unit of life that can reproduce and create its own energy and uh, stay stable and persist. And so at, at kind of the very, very basic understanding of life and how it works is this idea of symbiosis and cooperation. So I, I like to think that, <clears throat> you know, humans are part of that spectrum and, and this, this kind of uh, inherent cooperation is just is, is part of how we operate. And I think it's pretty fair to say that, you know, we wouldn't have gotten to where we are today in terms of, um, <clears throat> you know, our relative successes in creating uh, somewhat safe and stable environments for, you know, millions and millions of people um, without this, without the kind of the, the prevalence of cooperation. So I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, human cooperation is, is really the thing that has, has created the you know the progress or the kind of the progressive sort of cultures in our uh, that work towards making a more equitable culture um I'm, i'll get i get into a bit more detail with each of these little sections later so the idea of symbiosis and human cooperation is is something that if you look into like the biological origins even there's something called eusociality of insects so you have insects like ants and bees they, um, on their own, they wouldn't be able to survive, but when they work as a, as a unit, as a hive, as a, um, they can kind of do all kinds of amazing things, like, you know, build giant cities, explore territories, even start farming some ants, you know? Um, <clears throat> so this idea of cooperation and eusociality is just kind of built into why life is so successful and persistent. The next, uh, the next kind of concept that I find is really helpful in terms of cu cultivating an informed optimism is um, the idea of post scarcity. Now, this is a, this is you may have heard of this, but it's just the idea is um, <clears throat> post scarcity is a theoretical economic situation in which most goods can be produced in great abundance with minimal human labor needed, so that they become available to all very cheaply or even freely. Post-scarcity does not mean that scarcity has been eliminated for all goods and services, but that all people can easily have their basic survival needs met along with some significant proportion of their desires for goods and services. So this is the Wikipedia article. So it's just, an, it's a post-scarcity is a bit counterintuitive, but when you start to think about it and you look at sort of you know, all of the waste and excess and kind of resource mismanagement that uh, our civilization kind of uh, perpetrates. Um, and you kind of look at sort of how, in a sense, we've mastered certain manufacturing techniques and agricultural uh, processes so that we almost have, in some cases, too much food or, you know, we, we, we've begun to develop uh, you know, planned obsolescence so that the things that we make break, they don't last forever or, or they don't last a long time, just mostly because uh, the people who are making these things, you know, want to sell more. It's part of the kind of the capitalist model of eternal growth. <clears throat> so um, the idea of, for post-scarcity for me that is really empowering is that, okay, if you look around, we actually, as a civilization, we do have the ability to sort of create a better world already. We're just not, is we're not using it because it doesn't fit into this capitalist model of growth that, you know, uh, sort of like um, prioritizes profit, you know, and these profits end up just in the, in the pockets of a very few, relatively few people. Um, so post-scarcity is a concept that is, uh, it's very powerful powerful for me in cultivating a uh, informed optimism and uh, you like I I will link to another podcast there's, there's lots of people talking about it there's many proponents uh, one great uh, writer on the topic or kind of adjacent topic is Jeremy Rifkin 
He writes about kind of the future of um, manufacturing and networking and energy production. And um, yeah, very, very cogently and just sort of you know, drawing upon uh, examples from the present day, kind of showing how um, we're kind of there, but it, like we're there in terms of technology, but we're not there in terms of culture, like in terms of, you know, what we value and how, how we choose to organize ourselves. We're not there yet, but we're there in terms of technology. And that's incredibly heartening. And what it means is that we just um, have to, you know, change the way we organize our systems and that we can turn this sort of like uh, kind of environmental disaster of uh, industrial civilization around. Another uh, concept that has been really helpful for me in, in coming up with future parfait and like, you know, ways of thinking about uh, utopias and better, better civilizations and better cultures is... Uh, it's it's the thinking of this Indian guy, an Indian guru. He's kind of long dead. His name is Aurobindo Ghosh, and he's a very very interesting story. And he, um, as a as a child, he was he was raised in kind of colonial India, and his father loved the British and very much wanted his son to be part of the empire and part of the ruling class. So. He educated, or Aurobindo as a child was educated in all the Western classics, Western um, knowledge and science, and he was a prodigy, so he was able to read, you know, the, ori the original philosophers in Greek and in Roman, and he went to England to study and, uh, you know, you know, immerse himself in, like, science and evolution and, you know, um, <clears throat> lots of uh, kind of the progressive ideas at the time. And along the, along the way, he kind of decided that he wanted to go back to India and, you know, work alongside the likes of, like, Gandhi and sort of work towards the liberation of the country uh, from British colonial rule. <clears throat> so he went back to India, and when he got there, he, again, he was, he was, he was, he was a learning prodigy. He could teach himself languages. He learned Greek and Latin. Um, but he, he, when he got to India, he taught himself um, Sanskrit, and he went deep he kind of applied the same sort of uh, thirst for knowledge and rigor and learning to, you know, like reading the, the Vedic scriptures, kind of like the, the original sort of Hindu um, cosmologies. And, uh, and so he was in this weird, in a very interesting position, kind of at like, you know, in the 19, like 1920s or something. In a very early point, he was, he was kind of able to he had, you know, he had Western knowledge in part in his mind. He had this sort of Hindu Vedic knowledge in his mind. And uh, he came up with a really, really interesting synthesis of the two. <clears throat> um, his story is that he went back to India. He got involved with the, uh, the liberation movement, kind of, you know, what, what we think of uh, when we think of Gandhi. That's what Gandhi was doing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, originally he got, he and his brother, his family, um, they were supporting kind of a violent, like a uh, militarized revolt. Um, and so they, they staged some actions. They probably blew something up. And I think they might have killed someone. And in the process, Aurobindo was, you know, imprisoned. Like he was caught and imprisoned and put into jail. Um, <clears throat> he had become kind of a figurehead because he had, he, he spoke English. He read English. He could communicate in the language of the oppressor. He could kind of command that authority but uh, against the oppressor. So he, he, he became a, quite a uh, popular leader and uh, after s some violent uh, actions was put into jail. And so while he was in jail, he kind of had this revelation that he wasn't really interested in overall in, uh, <clears throat> in saving India or like, you know, uh, finding liberation for Indians, he was, he came to the conclusion that he was looking for kind of the liberation of all of humanity. It's kind of like a, a Buddha moment. Like, how do I end this suffering? Like, what kind of models can I propose to um, <clears throat> create this sort of uh, paradise on earth? And so he, uh, I guess, what's interesting is that he was able to synthesize and sort of reinterpret some of Vedic knowledge. Um, and kind of mash it together with ideas of evolution and human development and come up with this system uh, that is really complicated. It's got a lot of a lot of extra nuances and stuff that I won't necessarily get into, but w w what I kind of came out of it was that 
in the end, he was like, okay, we have to, like, the paradise is now um, in, say, Vedic scriptures and most kind of spiritual traditions. We're looking at, you know, an afterlife or sort of a, a time after existence where we will find satisfaction, you know, like a heaven or a nirvana. <clears throat> uh, but Aurobindo was like, uh, well, no, I, I think it's the other way around. I think that the earth is that heaven and that is a manifestation of like um, kind of the, the, the cosmic consciousness in the material world. That manifestation is the perfect world. That is the paradise and that is the now and that is the challenge of us as kind of individuals, biological consciousness who are self-aware um, to sort of manifest that, to bring the light of the, um, of, you know, the eternal consciousness down to earth and manifest it on the planet. So he came up with a, a yoga, I guess in India, yoga is science and it's kind of a method, a process. And so Orbino came up with something he called integral yoga. And integral yoga was about sort of listening to your kind of like, it's like being in touch with the, you know, the divine spirit, the divine consciousness that is, you know, um, within everybody and trying to come, being in touch with that and sort of following it, like sort of following its lead. And then that would allow you to kind of manifest your special individuality. And um, that special individuality, once manifested, will, will sort of sync with everyone else's sort of special individuality as they're also manifesting. And and the way those things interact, that the kind of that system would create the utopia. And that's, and that's not, it's not like, it, it really begins with the individual identifying like who they are, what they want, what makes them happy, what they want to move towards, and then finding other people or finding systems that they can engage in that will create that. So that, I mean, that's really roughly speaking, um, or being you know, there's like, he's, you he wrote a lot, like, uh, <laughs> I can't say I've read, you know, nearly... Um, you know, a small, even a small percentage of what he wrote. But essentially, that is what he's saying is that um, if we're like, the the destiny, say, of humankind is to manifest sort of this sort of uh, spiritual paradise on earth. And the way that we do that is we listen to our inner voices and we listen to what makes us special and what motivates us. And we try to manifest them in our lives and, uh, you know, engage other people and, you um, and by through this process of self-realization, we create our own utopia. And if everyone creates their own utopia, then they, they'll sort of mesh together and uh, and then create this sort of like a utopian multiverse. So uh, to me, that was important because when we think about utopias generally, um, they always end up as dystopias because, they, you know, <clears throat> they kind of follow this Western idea that um, there's a set of rules that must be applied to everyone. There's a set, there's an order to things that must be adhered to. Um, but the problem is that once you, if you try to set up a system of rules for, you know, a large group of people, it's like, you're always going to alienate somebody. Like no one's going to be happy with just one system. So in Aurobindo's world, it's kind of like um, you come up with your own system. And you make sure that that system is, you know, not not trampling on other people's systems, or it's not exploiting other people's systems, or like it's allowing for everyone else to to sort of manifest their own utopia. So, I, I mean, I, for me, that's a very useful concept for overcoming like the traditional barriers of utopia. Like when we think of, you know, utopias in general, it's always like is always like failed utopias. Utopias where someone tried to make a perfect world, but of course they had to fail because there's no such thing. Um, so Aurobindo's philosophy was really helpful for me, kind of like, again, jumping over that hurdle, like, yeah, it's possible. It's like, it doesn't, we don't have to be trapped by a, by a historical sense of what a utopia can and cannot be. Um, here's this guy who's, who's synthesizing these two, you know, epic philosophies, Western and Eastern into this into this one one vision for, about the evolution of man and the creation of a paradise on earth so i would uh yeah if you're interested i'd recommend uh looking into orabindo's work there's a really good book called the adventure of consciousness it's uh it's by a man called sat prem he's a disciple of orabindo um don't be put off by the kind of the, the spiritual sort of like um, flightiness. It might, it might seem very kind of hippy-dippy or, um, 
you know, not scientifically rigorous. I think uh, it's, you know, it's got a lot of um, kind of magical thinking in it, but ultimately the the image or the, the vision that it, uh, the model that it uh, describes, I think is really helpful. I mean, it's not, I don't think there's any one model really of uh, reality, uh, but we, we try to sort of, you know, incorporate many models uh, to sort of to uh, <clears throat> to kind of fill out the world that we live in. So, in terms of utopia and the problem of utopia, I found that uh, the work of Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo, um, uh, it was very helpful. And if you're interested in wacky architecture and like intentional communities, you go check out Oroville. Oroville is a actually a, a kind of a, a small town in India that was um, created uh, using kind of under the, created with the inspiration of Aurobindo's thinking. Um, it's a whole other story. It is kind of a failed utopia in some sense. It's still going, um, but it's, it you know, net could, couldn't possibly live up to the expectations uh, of its founders. Um, but a, a super interesting kind of, um, like project in urbanism and uh, intentional communities. So I would definitely check that out. It's called Oroville. So that's the utopian multiverse. And, and essentially to sum it up, it's like um, there are many utopias. Every person has to express their own utopia and find a place for that utopia in the bigger system. And I think that's important in that uh, another important aspect of that is that the, these, you, these, these visions and these actions and these creations are all very personal. It's like it's down to the individual. It's down to every one of us to kind of look inside, figure out what we want, and then move towards that. That's, uh, that's, I find that a very empowering message. There are two more concepts uh, that I kind of file under this category of, you know, uh, how, how to cultivate an informed optimism. And both these concepts are slightly related and they have to do, they're connected to through the use of the word speculative. Uh, speculative is a word that seems to have be coming into its own these days. Like there, there's a concept of speculative fiction, speculative design, and these are all sort of um, modes of thinking about the future or trying to create the future that are sort of based on what exists today. Like what, where are we starting from and where might it go? And then how can we design for that? So these are design practices that are relatively new, I think. Like they've been they've been around in some form or another for, you know, I'm sure decades, you know, or forever, you might say, as long as humans have been thinking about the future. But more recently, they've been formalized. Um, so the two concepts I want to talk about, one is called speculative pragmatism. The other one is called speculative design. Uh, speculative pragmatism comes from my reading of a French philosopher called Gilles Deleuze. Uh, Gilles Deleuze was a philosopher. Um, he was kind of active around the, from the late 60s. Well, oh, maybe probably like early 60s to like, uh, I think he died in like the late 80s or nine, early 90s or something. So he um, is a really interesting uh, thinker kind of very unconventional, did not really fit into the mold of like con uh, conventional sort of philosophical practices. Um, one of the most sort of enlightening essays that I read about his work, well, to, to preface this, I, one of my, my other drawing practice is a, is a long-term drawing practice and it, it's to illustrate a book of philosophy. The book is called A Thousand Plateaus. And A Thousand Plateaus was written by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. And uh, it's a really dense piece of writing that, uh, to me, it's, it's, it feels, um, it's got almost a mystic bend to it, a mystic bend. It's not mystical at all, though. He's, uh, he's very much grounded in, in um, you know, uh, Western thought and precedent and history. But in that book, Deleuze and Guattari are trying to dismantle, like, some of the ways of thinking that have that kind of bind our our culture into um, reductive patterns of behavior um, and a really really helpful essay that I read about uh, Deleuze's work was by Brian Masumi who's the English translator of A Thousand Plateaus he wrote an essay for the LA Review of Books 
a few years ago and kind of identifying speculative pragmatism as being the the thing that makes Deleuze Deleuze. So speculative pragmatism is a, what they what call like an image of thought. And probably the best way to think about it is to think about it in comparison to um, another image of thought called, uh, which, which is sort of like a more a Western traditional way of thought. And that, and that way of thought is, a, is sort of characterized by two things. One is generality and the second is critique. So this will sound pretty familiar to everyone. It's like generality and critique. It's like, so what, it's kind of what science does in, in many cases and what logic does. It's sort of like, you look at, you've got a bunch of things, you look at them and you say, well, these things are kind of the same and those things are kind of the same. So let's lump those into one group and these into one group. And when you start lumping these things into groups, you start sort of taking away aspects of them that make them unique. So. These things belong to one group because of a certain thing, uh, and that's that's what it is. That's what makes that thing important. So everything else is not so important because that's not what makes it part of this group. Um, and so that there's just two things going on there. One is this idea of generalization. Okay, so you've got all these one things, and you kind of generalize, say, oh, they're all similar in this way. And then there's this idea of critique, and then it's like, okay, so these things are all the same, and they're all share these things. So, you know, either that's good or that's bad, or you kind of make a judgment about them based on what what's holding them together. The problem with that is that when you, when you do that, you kind of, you, you, you stop looking at aspects of those individual things outside of it, like when they're not in a group, those, each of those individual things are actually unique and have many unique characteristics. And those unique characteristics are what's gonna make a difference. Like those, those are the things that are gonna make that object special. And so Deleuze was trying to propose a, a system where you, you kind of avoid that pitfall, whereas, you know, this, this traditional method of generalizing, putting things into boxes, and then um, <clears throat> identifying what makes them valuable uh, by reducing, you know, the number of qualities they have, uh, that, that leads to kind of where we are now, where, like, you know, um, things get put into boxes and discounted, you know, we're not, we're not looking at what makes something special. So uh, Deleuze's uh, philosophy, I guess, according to this, according to Masumi's article, and it rings true to me, um, was a kind of an image of thought that he called speculative pragmatism. And that instead of generality and critique, speculative pragmatism kind of um, uses uh, affirmation and singularity or say singularity and affirmation. So instead of kind of looking at a bunch of things and saying, oh, these are all the same, let's put them in a box over here and you know discount everything that's different about them and just focus on what's the same, is uh, you kind of, you gotta, you look at the, the whole field of things and you look at something and you say, wow, this is really unique and different. And then in, the way you think about it is you kind of affirm its difference and its uniqueness. Like what makes this special? What is this thing that's gonna allow this uh, object, concept, whatever to, evolve and develop and become more of itself. Um, and that is, and, and Deleuze was thinking like, that is how, that is how you get to kind of a, a more kind of complete understanding of things. Our tendency in the West to categorize, you know, taxonomize or whatever uh, things and put them into boxes and to try to understand them is actually, what it does is it separates them from everything else. And it creates this whole kind of like, um, uh, like it breaks the network of things. It uh, it allows us to be super callous. Like, you know, that's that thing is not part of this, so we can treat it a certain way. We can get rid of it. We can euthanize it or whatever, genocide it because it's not part of it. But in fact, everything is connected. Um, <clears throat> and so, this idea of speculative pragmatism does work its way into future parfait. I mean, it's, it's like it's it, to me, it's like a real. It, it's a great. Uh, kind of a guidepost or just a way of thinking about an object that uh, doesn't lead you to discount it or um, it, it actually it demands a creative response like you can't if your generality and critique is sort of lazy like you put it in a box you label it you forget about it singularity and affirmation you have to engage it you have to put yourself into that object you have to sort of um, uh, <clears throat> deal with it sort of firsthand and sort of understand it, you know, 
and in, uh, in order to, uh, well, it's more like you have to engage it in order to understand it. And by engaging it, it means sort of like um, investigating, putting yourself out there, giving it the benefit of the doubt, looking for what makes it special, and then highlighting that point. So that's speculative pragmatism. And I find that's, that, that's kind of at the core of future parfait and how I think about, you know, um, uh, how objects relate and concepts relate to each other. The other speculative aspect of uh, future parfait is, uh, say, speculative design. Now, that's like a uh, that's like a design method or practice that incorporates a bunch of different uh, modes of design. You have critical design, science fiction, prototyping, design fiction. Like these are all um, relatively new sort of ways of thinking about design that sort of um, are meant to expand the scope of what is possible, more or less. Like, uh, so instead of, you know, you've got designing for a fixed situation, <clears throat> you know, um, you want to sell a product or something to a certain demographic, uh, you are, are trying to imagine, like, where you want to be and how you can design for that instead. But, but to kind of take, take the same skills of design, the tools that you use to make a design, like understanding context, understanding materials and processes, understanding how people think and psychology, but um, but kind of trying to use those skills to create something that doesn't exist as yet, or even to fulfill a need that you're inventing that doesn't exist. So in in Future Parfait, the idea is that, okay, we want to create like a utopia. Uh, so then how can, you know, speculative design help? Like what what aspects of the present day kind of can feed into that vision. So um, I found a pretty good PDF about speculative design, and I, I'm going to also include that link uh, in this workshop. And that's, uh, yeah, those two concepts are really, really useful and uh, at the kind of sort of at the core of my future parfait and the, the project Welcome to D Double Dub. So uh, to sum up the last little bit, we uh, looked at how... Uh, how I approach uh, radical optimism, like uh, the, some of the concepts and ideas that allowed me to sort of get to a point where I could allow myself to think so optimistically, despite sort of, uh, you know, evidence from the world right now that, you know, we're in a several kind of apocalypses simultaneously, like the wildfires, the, the pandemic, um, you know, gross uh, inequality financially around the world and sort of the rise of far-right leaders and stuff. So all that is going on, but just there's <clears throat> there's actually a really vast undercurrent of positive activity that really drives human civilization. That's that's kind of what I wanted to emphasize. Um, and so once you realize that and you think about what, what are the possibilities, like how do we, how do we go, well, where do we go from there? And you think about a post-scarcity economy, what that means, what possibilities that opens up. The idea of how to approach utopia, like a utopia, there's no single utopia, like a utopia must be kind of a multiverse in a sense, uh, many, many utopias, each individual person basically lives their own utopia. And the work of that is trying to navigate how, how, how that utopia will mesh with others. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and the idea of evolution and symbiosis and human cooperation. So you've got all these, all these factors and forces that are there and the real, and how do they all come together into a single vision? So the the project Future Parfait, kind of the umbrella project that I have, um, uh, which the comic Welcome to D Double Dub, which was created for this exhibition, was was is a Future Parfait project, um, and I used sort of a Future Parfait methodology to develop it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what Future Parfait is. Um, <clears throat> It is, it's an art project, it's a world building project, it's a design methodology, it's kind of open-ended. I want to keep it just open and I think, uh, you know, and I think of it as a methodology because I, I hopefully, you know, other people can use it or, um, you know, follow it or kind of gain inspiration for, you know, ways of getting out of uh, this sort of doom thinking and into, into a mode where you can sort of be optimistic and kind of build and build imaginatively. Uh, you know, a better world for yourself. So, the uh, Future Parfait is, uh, I think of it as a thought experiment. It's got several parts. 
So the first part are kind of the, the, the premises, like the, the substrate, the substratum, say, a future parfait. And there's two, there's two points uh, to the substratum. Um, so this is like the starting point. This is where, you know, all that stuff from before that I talked about, this is where it gets you. This is sort of the base layer on, on which you design. And that is one, just, there's, two, there's two precepts. The first one is that <clears throat> civilization currently has the technological and cultural capacity to create an equitable global culture which operates within planetary boundaries and where each individual has the opportunity to thrive. That's precept one. That's kind of post-scarcity economy, kind of rolled into this idea of uh, speculative pragmatism, the, the image of thought of singularity and affirmation. Um, all these things kind of form precept one. Precept two is, uh, the, is, is as follows. The arc of civilization shows that mutually beneficial cooperation is more effective than territorial competition as a strategy for the evolution of human cultures. So that kind of gets back to this point that um, as much as it feels like we are dominated by kind of negative impulses, violent kind of territorial practices, kind of hier hierarchical systems, that the actual, the base layer of our success is cooperation. And it's the way that we work together and, uh, you know, build together that it actually produces all, all the really great progressive elements of human culture that we can sort of hold up as ideals and standards uh, on which uh, to build, you know, this uh, better imagined futures. And so the, the future parfait is a thought experiment. <clears throat> And so you take these two precepts and then you ask these questions to yourself. Or it's kind of like, a, it's a question to all creators. And it goes like this. Imagine your own perfect world, making space for all others. Now imagine evolving, imagine it evolving from the present day. So it's pretty simple. I mean, you've got those two substratum kind of things like uh, <clears throat> civilized we have the technology we have the possibility to do this and uh, history shows us that cooperation and you know you know humans being compassionate empathetic empathetic kind of social creatures are, are what gets us moves us forward and then the idea of like what is your um, perfect world I think uh, one of the really important parts of this is that um, as much as we kind of lived in the shared reality and that's kind of uh, how we thrive, it's like each, indiv each individual person kind of has to make a conscious decision about what they want, about how they want to live and uh, um, you know, what systems they want to live in. What do they want to support by you know, everyday decisions like where you live, what you eat, what you wear, you know, who you support. Um, so it all starts with the individual, and that, that kind of is the key. And part of the difficult work of this, I think, like, we do tend to want to uh, be told what to do, in a sense. Like, I think, um, you know, much of our culture is kind of based on that, of like, uh, it doesn't, it, uh, there's like a fine balance between, you know, um, the maverick and the, the kind of obedient citizen can't have too many mavericks and too many obedient citizens kind of are you know lead to situations where you can get authoritarian and uh, exploitative uh, leaders at the top so the idea is that each individual person must kind of be able to sort of conceive of their own perfect world and that's the big question so you could say that welcome to D-double-dub and the future parfait world that I come up with uh, that is my perfect world and so I'm trying to build out a series of um, structures, you know, uh, social structures, economic structures, and uh, cultural st cultural structures that will allow people to thrive. Like it's like an open scaffolding. It's like it's not. Um, it's more like a just a steady, a solid platform on which to build uh, a world on which anyone can sort of inhabit and then there and then kind of create their own world as long as they um, <clears throat> they don't kind of um, step on other people or exploit other systems or you know species ecosystems communities 
So I put together a few worksheets uh, for this, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill them out. Um, I'm going to do them for uh, for D double dub. Like you know, how how did I get to D double dub? How did I imagine these uh, scenarios? So they um, <clears throat> I will um, I'll just run through all the worksheets, and then I'll show samples of how of how I filled them out. And uh, now I might hopefully sort of be able to give you a sense of um, what to do, how to approach it. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to download the worksheets for yourself and perhaps, you know, uh, work through some of these things yourself. Like if you have a speculative design project you have to do or, you know, you're just sort of curious yourself or you're actually into world building as, a, as a, an author or an artist. Um, these worksheets might help you just, yeah, move towards a kind of a more optimistic vision. Future Parfait, worksheet number one. So this is, this, this one is, is a worksheet through which you can, um, kind of work through the first, the first question of the thought experiment, and that is, imagine your own perfect world. So that's, um, I don't know, like, if you spent, I mean, I'm sure it's, it's uh, it could be tricky to sort of do that. I mean, it takes some work. Like you got to know yourself, follow your emotions. But this this worksheet sort of like it um, it asks you to sort of imagine like your uh, a perfect day, like um, and by perfect day I mean just a day that you in your memory where you just were really satisfied by the end of it. You felt you had a number of activities or like everything's just kind of fell into place and it felt good, and you have fond warm memories of it. Um, and I'm sure everyone has several of those in their lifetimes and, uh, you know, hopefully, and maybe more. Um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, the first, the first worksheet is, um, trying to help you imagine that those perfect days, I've got them here. I mean, you can, if you write it out, uh, you can see I've got couple of perfect days here, one, two, and three. So um, the idea is like, uh, just think about those those days that you really love and you think about fondly and just try to just break down what happened. Like, you know, what were the order of things? What did you do in the morning, the evening, and the night? Doesn't that, all these exercises, they shouldn't be too, don't think about them too much. Really just feel your way through them. Um, it's a great, uh, I always think of this line, uh, follow your bliss. Is a, a the, by the author Joseph Campbell wrote a book uh, called Follow Your Bliss, and um, <clears throat> it's essentially about he, he he was sort of famous for identifying the hero and writing a book called The Hero's Journey, in which he kind of dissects this sort of global archetype about um, the hero, about somebody leaving a situation, you know, by either being evicted or forced out, and kind of going on this grand adventure, picking up a boon and then bringing it back to their um, the, the place where they start is they bring this gift back and they come back and they add to the community. Now that's it in a nutshell. Like it's it's a lot bigger than that, but um, the idea is that it's an it's a global archetype uh, and a story archetype. Uh, so Joseph Campbell sort of wrote this book. It was kind of got pretty popular. It actually influenced George Lucas when he was writing Star Wars, and um, he had wrote another book called Follow Your Bliss. And and Follow Your Bliss was sort of looking at um, it kind of what it comes down to is it's just like follow what, like, find out what makes you happy, kind of what brings you joy, I guess, is a way of saying it in a more contemporary kind of uh, meme, you know, the Marie Kondo uh, uh, <clears throat> mode of, you know, editing your personal possessions. So, yeah, what, what kind of, what brings you joy? Like, like, move towards that. Like, that is the thing that sort of, that identifies, um, and I don't mean like, I mean like, by joy and by bliss, I, I don't mean like, you know, a, like a, a sugar rush or like a temporary high. I mean, that's part of it, but really the, the important things are like, what uh, what kind of sustains you? What are what are activities that bring you sort of a more longer term gratification and kind of puts you in a really like strong, solid, confident place, you know? So that's the idea with this, with, all, with this entire uh, thing is like, you have to kind of recognize um, like use that use that idea of bliss and uh, what brings you joy is kind of the lighthouse. That's where you're moving towards uh, through all of this. So the first worksheet has uh, 
spots for day one, day two, day three. So maybe three perfect days that you can remember. And, uh, and then uh, sort of then assembling it into sort of a peak week, like just sort of, if you take, if you consider those three perfect days, like what you were, what happened, and then try to look for a trend or look for a, um, a uh, kind of a motif, and then think about it as a week, like, because to be honest, you can't be doing, I think most people, uh, like certain amount of repetition and regularity and routine is excellent for getting, for productivity and everything like that. But also, but of course you can't be the same thing all the time because then um, you, you get into ruts, you get into, uh, you know, familiarity, which breeds contempt and sort of, uh, you, you start to long for other things. So the idea is, is to imagine like you're, like maybe a few perfect days, like what are the qualities, what were you doing? And, uh, and then sort of try to take those moments and feelings and craft a week like a work week or think about it. I think about it kind of like a work week. Like, what do you want to be doing with your time? So that's the, uh, that's the first, that's the first worksheet. And the, it is important to, uh, to really not hold back. Like don't, I, this is not a, this is not an exercise where you're constrained by excuses or rationality. Well, uh, this is impossible. So I don't want to do that. No, this is, this is blue sky. This is just, just your absolute kind of fantasy in a way. And don't be shy. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's worksheet number one. So the idea is to just imagine, you know, a period of time, a few days, a week, uh, that would make you really happy. That's worksheet one. Okay, so worksheet two. Worksheet two is is also part of the first uh, question in the thought experiment. Imagine your own perfect world. And uh, this one, I, this, this is okay, part two of that question. And uh, the subtitle of this worksheet is Dream Jobs and Happy Places. So now it's sort of like, okay, so you've, you've imagined perfect days and kind of like a peak weeks, like just sort of potential uh, scenarios where you, you could imagine that it would feed you and you could have a series of activities and like, uh, places and things that you're doing that bring you a lot of gratification and satisfaction. And now this one is sort of, um, it's a different approach. And what I have is I've got lists here, of like just, you know, um, write down like your happy places or dream jobs, heroes and role models, flow activities, um, your tribes and favorite, favorite worlds. So if I wanna break that down, like happy place is kind of, um, it's pretty obvious. It's sort of like, you know that there are some places in the world where you just feel comfortable. You just feel like, you can relax and be yourself, and um, you are happy. Uh, you're you're safe. You're secure. You're comfortable in a sense. I mean, it could be you could be jumping out of an airplane. So you're not exactly safe, but that's a place where you are, you know, feeling alive and confident. Dream jobs. That's another one. Like, don't be shy about that. Like, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of <laughs> uh, there's a really. Uh, Really interesting kind of economic thinker, David Graeber, who recently just passed away, unfortunately. But he uh, he kind of wrote an essay a few years ago about bullshit jobs. Pardon my French. Uh, but BS jobs are it's, it's sort of um, the I, the the point he was trying to make is that the way our sort of current system is set up is that there are a lot of jobs out there that don't really need to exist. They've just kind of they've accumulated in kind of the managerial strata of large corporations. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's just all to acknowledge that uh, our, our world of work is not, it's not designed for human satisfaction. It's designed for the bottom line. And uh, so when you think of a dream job, it don't be limited by, you know, what is going to make you money or um, <clears throat> what is uh, practical. It's so more like what kind of daily activity, which, you know, is associated with production or making something, uh, something useful for another person that might, they might find value in it. Um, but what, what, are, what are those activities? Like maybe it's, uh, it could just be, you know, making music, making art, um, generally kind of making stuff or helping people. Like if you're a chef or you're a nurse, you know, like those types of jobs, which, which give you kind of the level of interaction and a sense of helping out people and, and kind of contributing to the greater good. So that's, but it doesn't have to be that. Really, it's just be your dream job. Like, what is your dream job? And I'm going to fill these in and maybe talk about my answers a little bit. Uh, so then we have dream jobs and we have 
heroes and role models, like who are people that you look up to? Like a lot of times you can say like, wow, I wish I kind of had that life. Or, you know, that person really inspires me in the way that they, they approach problems or have been able to overcome certain things. So write those down. I'll give you a sense of like um, where your heart is or where your heart wants to be, like who you want to emulate. The next one is a flow activity. Like it's, it's kind of like a dream job, but it's it's more a bit more abstract. Like a flow activity uh, is an activity where you sort of lose a sense of time. Like you lo almost lose sense of self. Like you're just in there doing it. Like you you talk to high high level athletes or artists, uh, musicians. Like um, when they're in their in the kind of their peak mode of productivity and doing something like uh, whatever it be like playing basketball or you know composing music or performing a concert or making a painting like you sort of it's not quite detached but you you really connect with like a, a greater existence like you're in, you're in the flow you're kind of in the in the matrix and uh, grooving along with all of that and i'm sure if you have a feeling of like satisfaction or kind of a sense of timelessness like you lose track of time and uh you kind of have like almost an infinite energy you don't get tired, that type of thing. Those are flow activities. I mean, for me, flow activity is drawing, of course. Um, I love dancing. I mean, it's not really a, not formal dancing, but just, you know, moving to, you know, house, disco, techno, like just body movement, I find is a flow activity. It's not producing anything, but we actually, we find out now that, you know, this that type of movement um, is kind of, is really good for you. Like it uh, produces dopamine. It kind of, um, we know our body is actually designed to move. If we're not moving, it's sort of things start to slow down and calcify. And so uh, movement is essential anyway. So dancing for me is a flow activity. Uh, it doesn't produce anything except for a good feeling, kind of a healthy body. But that's, you know, that's actually probably some of the most important things. Um, and then your tribes is sort of, uh, that's kind of your communities. Like who are the people you are most comfortable with? Uh, for me, it'd be like cartoonists or, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, fellow artists, like-minded people, um, architects. And, you know, it's, it just could also be, you know, your your crew from university, your, your friends from high school. Like, who are they and kind of what qualities do they, <clears throat> do they share? And the last one here is fictional worlds. <clears throat> and that is like... Um, like, are there any novels or kind of the fictional worlds in, in like mag and not magazines, uh, novels or movies or um, video games where you think, wow, this is great. I kind of want to live here. Uh, for me, I'm like, I think the Star Trek world, that whole uh, Federation, Cosmos or whatever is, um, is one is one of my favorites. Like, I definitely as a kid, I was way more into Star Wars. But now as an adult, I think, wow, well, Star Trek makes more sense to me. Um, also one recent Guardians of the Galaxy, that, uh, that world they built there was sort of like, to me, kind of ideal, like there was stress and struggle and conflict, but just felt like it was really open and, um, uh, like kind of more open to possibility than it was about, you know, the end of the world type thing. <clears throat> so if you have any, like, yeah, so this, so for this, this section is just kind of make a, make a quick list of these things and then just get them in your head. And, and the next panel is sort of, it's like, it's two panels. It's kind of like, how would they, how could you imagine them putting them together? Like if you had took a dream job and a perfect world and a flow activity and a happy place, and like you just created a scene in your mind, like what would that be? And it really is, um, these activities are not meant to be super thought about. They're meant to be felt. They're meant to be about following your bliss. The third worksheet um, is is part of the, okay, like the first part of the thought experiment, which is imagine your own perfect world, making space for all others. So this is the making space for all others part. And that is, okay, once you kind of have gone through this exercise of like, what is your perfect world? Um, you know, or not even like what, what, what might be like a, a, a perfect day or peak week or a, where would that happen? Who are you with? What are you doing? And then it's sort of time to take a step back and be like, okay, so this exists. This is great. This is perfect for me. This is what I want. Now is, how am I, is there, is there, am I stepping on anyone's toes here? Am I like exploiting any systems or, you know, 
ecosystems, biological systems, you know, communities to, to get to this? Like, do I have to exploit someone or something to get here? Um, fortunately, in the future parfait experiment, you know, we've got the substratum to fall back on. So the idea is that uh, we're in a post-scarcity world and civilization, and we do have the capacities to kind of provide the material structure and the material sort of foundation for, to, for everyone to kind of pursue their dreams. Um, so long as you're not, uh, you know, it doesn't involve like the actual, you know, mass murder of like blue whales or something, or, you know, uh, <clears throat> as long as it doesn't like directly involve that type of thing, I think you're pretty good. But, um, but of course everything, like, of course it's kind of important to even, um, understand or just, just sort of, uh, like make something up in a way. So this is what I'm saying. It's like, okay, so you have a desired outcome. Like, here we go. This, this is a really simple sheet. Um, we've got a, a, a column, three columns. The first column is desired outcome or your plan, like what you hope to accomplish, where you hope to get to. Uh, the second one is um, potential harm to others. Like where might this, um, these, this idea, where might it take you or where might it uh, get tripped up in that, you know, you're, you're, you make a decision, you have to act, you've got to do something. But when you do that, you affect other people in a negative way or other, you know, uh, things in a negative way. And then just a possible workaround. Like, again, we're in the, an imaginative world. We're in a post-scarcity economy. Like, just, like, how, how, might, how might we work around this? So, again, I'm going to uh, fill out these sheets and talk a bit about uh, how um, they apply to Welcome to D-Double-Dub. Like, I can just do that and... Uh, yeah, and then you get a sense of <clears throat> of maybe how to approach that problem. But uh, I, I gave I left three spaces. I mean, don't don't feel as though you have to fill out all of them. Um, but I think at least one or two. Even if you can't think of something immediately, just maybe think of uh, something that's super, not even maybe that important. But I think the idea is to it's important to go through the exercise of thinking, consider looking at what you plan to do, and then. Um, <clears throat> And then sort of just running through a couple cycles of how, how this might affect or not affect other people. And if it affects them adversely, then what, how can you, how can you kind of change your plan to accommodate them? I think uh, it's, uh, it's useful. And I think that uh, it, it just helps you open, kind of uh, open your mind to other points of view, which uh, I think is kind of a necessary um, <clears throat> necessary thing to do when you're trying to design like a utopia for everybody. So the last worksheet, worksheet number four, is uh, it, it, it addresses the, the second part of the Future Parfait uh, thought experiment, which is the first part is imagine your own perfect world, uh, making space for all others. The second part is imagine it evolving from the present day. Now, um, so this worksheet is, you know, you've got, it's got also three parts. The first column is, um, it is uh, contemporary concepts, tools, and technologies that you think might go into creating your perfect world. Like, um, again, I'll, I'll fill in with some examples from D-Double-Dub, like <clears throat> I talk about things like the donut economy, um, universal basic income, uh, 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 the half earth uh, policy, sustainable retreat, like those, those are all things that exist today. And they're concepts that, you know, have been put forward in various uh, disciplines. <clears throat> but and they, for me, they form kind of a kind of a really solid foundation for uh, some kind of global, you know, uh, equitable culture. And then the next part is this sort of like a timeline. I haven't graded. I mean, it could be, you could have it by year or by, you know, decade or by century. Like in, for me with the D-double dub, I think, well, you know, the scale, the, the pace of change for this scale that I'm thinking about is not a year or a month. It's more like decades. So I think when I, when I fill it in, it'll have, it'll be by decades. Like, so, you know, Cultures shift and civilizations can shift pretty quickly, but overall, I think it's like we look like a 50, 100 years for something to really turn around or change dramatically. 
I mean, of course, that's not always the case. Things can happen very fast. But even if they seem like they're happening fast, I think, broadly speaking, like the big systemic change still will take decades. And the last, this last box is a vision for the future. So you almost would, would fill this out and then you'd fill this one out and then you're trying to like figure out how these things combine to create this. And so that's uh, that's the fourth worksheet. And that's those are all the worksheets. There's four worksheets and they kind of, they, they follow the, the future parfait thought experiment and they kind of help you think through them. So um, up next, I'm going to fill out those worksheets and then uh, kind of run through them with you. And yeah, that'll be it. Hopefully you get a sense of how I created D double dub and the thoughts that went into uh, making it. And um, maybe apply it to your own personal utopia. I mean, I'm super interested in hearing from you uh, about like, what you come up with. I think, uh, you know, part of the challenge now is, in a sense, is like okay, so everyone's got to really think hard about what they want and then kind of work together to to build it because it is you know it's not going to it'll be the product of cooperation there's no single person who's going to be doing this all by themselves okay so i'm going to fill out the sheets and come back with my uh m my my finished sheets and and how and hopefully it will give you a sense of how i came to creating welcome to d double dub the comic Okay, so I've uh, taken some time. I fil filled out uh, worksheets uh, for the m kind of my vision, my own kind of personal vision of uh, utopian future. I've filled out my uh, worksheets here. I'm going to uh, I'm going to put them on the screen uh, while I talk about them, and uh, you can follow along. Okay, so here's the first one, and. Uh, it's imagine your own perfect world, part one, perfect days and peak weeks. So yeah, if, when I think about my perfect days, um, it always has to do with making stuff or being kind of, um, or like exploring, learning new things. Like those are maybe the two key uh, types of experiences that I really treasure and value. I, you could say that I'm, a, I'm like an info file. I just love learning about things. And, and I find like this, this knowledge, um, helps me kind of it all goes into this model of the universe that I kind of maintain and uh, it's what allows me to um, say it's organize existence in that sense uh, so <clears throat> so for me like my perfect day is day one I'm you know I wrote waking up here but you kind of coffee I love coffee breakfast and you know a little snack something to fill the stomach and then reading um, there's nothing I find early in the morning reading is really uh, a, a pleasure, and you can kind of kind of primes the mind for thinking. And then shortly afterwards, it's like getting down to drawing. I find um, if you can kind of get to, I find I'm most productive in the mornings. So I really like to keep my mornings. Uh, if ideally, you kind of get up, uh, sort of prime your mind, and then get to work uh, for a few hours, and then. A lot of uh, kind of my most best concentration and focus happens in the morning. So then here I've got afternoon, do some more drawing, uh, then have lunch, a kind of must be later lunch, then go for a walk. Like once you've sort of done your work, then just go out into the world, you know, go experience the world, go for a walk. I visit galleries and bookstores. Those are some of my happy places. Um, then meet friends for dinner, you know, be sociable. And if it's a quiet evening, nothing planned, I kind of, you know, friends, go home, you know, do some more reading and then go to bed. So that's like a, a quiet, productive, kind of solitary day. Day two, I've got um, getting up and then exercising because, yeah, just uh, getting mobile and active and getting the blood going first thing is also, uh, you know, it's a good practice. Kind of helps uh, set the pace of your day coffee shower then go to work I, right now and the the other type of work that I really enjoy is a communal creative activity I worked as a scenic painter for a number of years and um, <clears throat> going into like a studio a shared studio where you've got a team and you're all on the same page and you're working towards a common goal it's it's uh, as much as I'm kind of introverted and love working on my own um, this type of communal creative work really is a real pleasure uh, it's like a, 
again, I think, you know, humans are sort of hardwired for this type of communal activity. And, uh, yeah, I, I place it as a priority. Like, even though it could be a long hours and um, uh, kind of, you know, hard work, you're on your feet or you're up and down ladders. and But just the, uh, the, the physicality of it and the, the commu communality of it is uh, super appealing to me. So for my day two perfect day is like, you know, working on a, on like a movie, movie set or large scale collaborative uh, sculpture or installation, something creative. It, I mean, it could be setting up like a pop-up restaurant or, you know, setting up for some kind of social event like a party. And then, so you're working, you're working this collaborative practice, just generally kind of a long day. Then, you know, call, you call it, you know, a day maybe around five or six, um, like a full day of work. And then you have dinner, you know, relax, you know, hang out with a friend or a special friend, you know, for some really, uh, <clears throat> so close sort of uh, friendship and go to bed. Um, the day three, I, uh, this is something I, I found what I really enjoyed doing when I was traveling. And that would be to wake up and then just go for a walk. Like you're in a new city, you're in a new place. Um, uh, Hanoi was really good. Hanoi in Vietnam uh, was was a real uh, pleasure. You just kind of get up and you just wander the streets. They're so different. And the, and the streets in Hanoi, they change throughout the day. So in the morning, you've got vendors set up in certain areas. And you go back to that same corner in the afternoon, it's a whole different scene, like different vendors or no vendors, it's all traffic or parked bikes or something. Um, and so it's, to me, I get, I get a huge kick out of that, just kind of absorbing the life of a city, like the patterns of existence and um, yeah, kind of the psychogeography of just sort of wandering and exploring and, and you know, coming across new things. And while doing that, you know, you bring a sketchbook, you're drawing, like you're always, always kind of engaging the world creatively on some form or another. And then on day three in the evening, I have go dancing. Uh, I spent most of my 20s kind of going out and dancing, you know, uh, techno, house music. I found um, <clears throat> it was... Uh, yeah, immensely satisfying. It's like a form of exercise. It's like your body gets what it needs in terms of motion, you know, respiration, cardiovascular activity. Uh, but it's all in the service of kind of like an aesthetic response of movement. And um, I have a real fondness for, you know, uh, bass music, house, techno, uh, disco, like all of these, these uh, kind of body moving musics. Uh, real pleasure and great great fond memories of you know many many evenings dancing with friends um, <clears throat> and so those are my perfect days you kind of get a sense uh, and then the peak week I've got uh, say like seven days here and the first few days first couple of days you might spend in your studio by yourself like you're working on your own thing you're intensely focused on a project you're getting out your ideas and then days three and four, I have kind of in the collaborative studio environment. So like perhaps there's uh, a deadline or a project where my particular skill is needed on set or, you know, in a particular installation or place or environment. And I would go there, kind of assist and do what I can, you know, co my contribution to the project. Like maybe I'm not the main architect of the project, but I'm going in to do something and I can get my collaborative fix there, my collaborative kind of communal work fix there. Um, and then day, that's day three and four. And day five, six, and seven, I have uh, like travel. I put some travel in, kind of getting to nature. Uh, so <clears throat> it could be going like, it'd be like, it looks like the equivalent here of like a long weekend uh, where you go out to a lake or a, uh, you know, a beach somewhere <clears throat> and just absorb the nature, kind of... Uh, and in that time, like, you know, swimming, walking, um, right here, I've got, uh, you know, reading, working, like you can bring laptops or sketchbooks and just kind of sit by the ocean or, you know, lake and just make stuff and be in nature and kind of get all the benefits of biophilia. So that is, that's my worksheet number one. So you get it kind of, you can kind of see the seeds of D-Double Dub in there, like this creative production, um, people aren't, we're not so concerned about earning money, let's say, uh, even though all the work that we're doing is kind of 
contributing to an economy, like whether it be uh, like the production of artworks or <clears throat> even the production of community, the production of a party or food or, you know, a meal for people. So that is my worksheet one. So uh, worksheet two is imagine your own perfect world, part two, dream jobs and happy places. So here I've got, um, you know, the list of happy places, dream jobs, heroes and role models, flow activities, tribes, favorite worlds. So I'll just go through them and You'll, you'll get it, like, um, if you've read the D-Double Dub comic, then perhaps you will sort of understand, uh, you know, how my personal, uh, like, utopia and visions are kind of folded into that project. Like, you'll see there's all kinds of trends here, or correspondences, let's say. So for Happy Places, um, yeah, I'm going to put the, the form on the screen now so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So for um, happy places, we've got home studio is number one, like that really is where I'm most comfortable uh, sitting at my desk, drawing, thinking, uh, scheming and dreaming, kind of letting my imagination uh, run. Um, uh, and then the second place is by the ocean. I just love the ocean. Um, like the, the seafront, the tides, the waves, the air, the energy. Um, there's not like one of my favorite activities, say, other than dancing, physical activities, like is playing in the waves. Like if you can get a beach where the waves are just big enough to kind of have enough power to um, throw you around, but not super dangerous, like where they're going to slam you and break your neck or like uh, there's, you have to be very careful playing in the waves. You have to spend some time getting to know what the beach is doing and, you know, talk to people about riptides and things like that. Like it can be very dangerous, but it can be ex totally exhilarating. It's one of my favorite things is to play in the waves. And my third happy place is on the dance floor. So yeah, it's kind of a hedonic streak here, but this is what we're doing. We're following our bliss, right? So um, <clears throat> dancing movement um, that suggests communality and like a DJ and just Relating, relating kind of indirectly to a crowd, but on a dance floor. So dream jobs, I can list them pretty easily. A one cartoonist, which is like a, a writer artist. So I mean, kind of what I was doing with D-Double Dub. It's like you, you can write and draw and kind of <clears throat> produce your vision to share. The second one is teaching creative practices. Yeah, I have done, I haven't done a lot of teaching. Um, but I do like it. It can be very gratifying. Like uh, it's a way of reinforcing your own knowledge. It's a way of learning. Uh, when and uh, re and so when you're when you have to explain something to somebody, it's um, you get, like it requires for you to be clear in your mind about that thing. And and that uh, that practice or uh, kind of results in sort of a clarification of your own thinking, which I find quite valuable and pleasurable. Um, and then another dream job. Uh, yeah, you could say I got scenic painter here because scenic painting, um, while like you're not necessarily creating, you're not in, in control of what you're making, but you are part of a team and it's a creative exercise and you're, you're physically moving. Like when you're a scenic painter, you're plastering, you're rolling, you're applying vinyl, so many skills and so much kind of knowledge to be gained. So you're also learning a lot uh, in the early years, like you're just constantly learning, you know, best practices and how to be professional and safe in what you do. And um, it does, uh, yeah, it's it can, it can be a great sort of team experience as well with the right people. So my heroes and role models, I've got uh, Gilles Deleuze. So he's the philosopher that I spent a fair amount of time uh, thinking about and interpreting his work into diagrams. Uh, his he had a really, um, uh, what, what do you say, like unconventional sort of trajectory in philosophy, like the the, the people he studied, uh, the the kind of the sequence of his writing was a little idiosyncratic, and he, he pulled in philosophers who weren't really part of, you know, uh, canons in a way. Um, so he was, uh, he, what he did was he kind of took from the past, like all the best ideas that suited his, his kind of, uh, way of thinking or approach to philosophy. And he kind of formed it into this, into this greater work, which sort of speaks to a, uh, 
philosophy that uh, tries to remain open. It's sort of it's rigorous, and, it, and it's uh, <clears throat> its intent is to kind of make the world a better place. It comes from sort of a revolutionary uh, standpoint. Um, uh, the second hero and role model is a guy named Abdullah Okalan. And Okalan, he's a, he's kind of like a he's like a Sri Aurobindo, except he's still alive. He's a Kurdish leader. Um, the Kurds uh, were a kind of a, a people in the Middle East, a whole civilization, a three thousand year old culture that they weren't. When the Middle East was divided up after the war, um, or whenever it was in the forties or thirties. Uh, the Kurds weren't given their own country, uh, which was a huge tragedy in my in my uh, opinion. Like when they're when uh, the powers that be were carving up the land, uh, you know, you got this whole series like Turkey, uh, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and uh, the Kurds kind of occupied a band like sort of like that kind of ran along the northern edge of uh, Iraq, Syria, and into Turkey. And they were never given their land. So, um, sort of through like since that period and in the 70s, 80s, 90s, like there was this Kurdish sort of a uh, guerrilla movement, kind of almost an armed revolution, trying to take land for themselves. And Okalan played a big role in that. He uh, was one of the organizers of the uh, the PKK in Turkey. Um, so that was effectively kind of a terrorist or it was a terrorist organization in a sense. And um, he um he was put into prison and you know spent he's probably spent the rest you know the last 20 years in jail but in that time he's had a lot of time to think and he's come up with several a couple of really great books they're free online um and they 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 kind of introduce his his idea his solution to the problem of the kurds like how how can how can a a, you know, a culture a, with a population in the millions, which has no state, how can they organize and how can they kind of remain intact and keep their culture and not be kind of wiped out? Um, you know, uh, so he, he, he came up with several, well, one one kind of form, I guess you call it like a modern democratic form, democratic confederalism, which is, uh, I talk about in the, uh, in D-Double Dub. So, He's, his, uh, his thinking is in there. Super interesting character. His name is Abdullah Okalan, and I think I'll probably make a list of links uh, to go with this workshop. And you'll be able to read more about his work. Uh, he's a definite role model, just in the way that he had to kind of almost invent or synthesize his own um, model for democracy in, in a way that sort of bypassed kind of the the limitations of the nation state, which I think are um, kind of, uh, they're, they're not serving humanity right now. The nation states are, some of them are, but for the most part, they're hierarchical power structures that are easily hijacked by, uh, you know, people who are more interested in power than they are in serving populations. My fourth hero, third hero is Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson is a, an American author. He's dead now, but he was a he was a countercultural figure. He he wrote a bunch of books in the '60s and kind of was a compatriot of Timothy Leary and I don't know about Terence McKenna, but that's kind of like the first wave of some kind of psychedelic or maybe second wave of psychedelic uh, thinkers and pioneers and psychonauts. Um, I was turned on to him when he on a podcast where he's ex he's kind of talking about Timothy Leary's Eight Circuit model of human consciousness, which is pretty far out. Um, but at the same time, kind of resonates well. And, and actually, if you, if you're open to it, it, it does sort of work. Like if, if you're not rigorously, uh, adhere, a rigorous adherent to any one dogma or set of beliefs about how, you know, reality is structured, uh, Robert Anton Wilson's interpretation of Timothy Leary's, uh, models of consciousness are really inspiring. Like they'll open your mind to different possibilities or kind of, potential ways of thinking about how, you know, um, consciousness is manifested and organized in the, the material world. Very, very interesting. And he's all, he has a, he's got a really strong kind of subtext of humor in his work that is just a delight. And it kind of, it's perfect. It's sort of like, um, humor really allows you to bypass a lot of, um, 
a lot of kind of uh, things that would make you kind of pause or stop or, you know, like be suspicious of these ideas. But if, if, you, if someone can present these ideas, but also not take themselves too seriously, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's a potent combination. So those are my heroes and role models. Um, and then flow activities, obviously it's like, uh, we're seeing a, a pattern here. Drawing is flow activity for me. Dancing is a flow activity and playing in the waves. So there you go. Yeah, by the ocean. It's all, they all kind of loop together. It's not, it's not a, <laughs> difficult to do these lists when you're following your bliss. Uh, my tribe. So I, who do I relate to? I relate to other artists, other kind of, um, you know, self-guided creators, people who are uh, sort of investigating, you know, reality kind of aesthetically um, in whatever way, like, so artists, travelers, I think um, I definitely have uh, an affinity for those people who are kind of identify as travelers or nomads, you know, people who aren't super planted and kind of they're willing, they can they can kind of move easily between cultures and um, uh, kind of adapt and are, are curious about new things. So love talking to travelers, whether I'm traveling and I meet someone who's local or or I'm you know, in a place and I meet someone who's a traveler, I just, there's a, there's a kind of a, a mode of being, a kind of that you can kind of tune into. And, uh, uh, I find it, uh, yeah, very comforting. And then, uh, at the other end of the tribes, there is architects and designers. So yeah, architects, I went to architecture school. I was never a big fan of the profession, but I, I love the way architects think. They have to think at many scales. They think of the scale of like a doorknob or they can think of the scale of a city block. And um, they are, like other designers, are kind of have to be critically engaged with their own mind. Like they're, you know, you can, you can kind of, to be an architect and to make a building that's going to be around for a hundred years or, you know, maybe 50 years now or something, but something that is permanent, semi perm well, you know, for permanent and, uh, it's going to affect the way people's people live in that place. Like it, it'll have a strong effect. Like buildings have an enormous effect on how you uh, how your day goes. Like if you're stuck in a think of it, if you're stuck in a, a room with no windows for eight hours, or if you're stuck in a glorious sunlit atrium for eight hours, like that's going to really affect your mindset once you leave those places. So architects um, architects are my tribe. And now this one's fun. Favorite worlds, fictional and non-fictional. Um, yeah, Star Trek universe, like, that's, to me, is, like, is, it's, like, a really mature utopia, I find, like, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's room for conflict and war in the form of, you know, uh, between alien races, I don't, I don't know how I feel about aliens or whether or not that's, uh, that will ever happen or if it's even important, if it does or not, but the Star Trek world kind of is, is, is utopian in that it, it's, like, a post-scarcity, knowing, like, you've got the, the uh, <clears throat> the thing that makes food, whatever it's called, uh, I forget what it's called. Um, so you can get your your uh, you know, there's, there's you're not no one is suffering for like a lack of physical stuff in Star Trek, and to me that uh, that's really inspiring. <laughs> I think that's important. And I think doable too. Uh, there's a a sci-fi author called Ian M. Banks, and he he invented a kind of a, a world, a sci-fi world that is, um, and uh, a civilization that he calls the culture. And the culture is like a really, seems like a very progressive, open society, a bit anarchic, but there's an, just enough structure to hold it together, but it allows um, its inhabitants like so many possibilities or ways of being uh, that are, you know, um, technologically um, sort of powered, uh, so it, 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 it's a, I find it a very satisfying world uh, to inhabit is the culture from Ian M. Banks. And the third one, uh, put the Shire from Lord of the Rings. It's, it's almost like whenever I'm traveling and you get to a place, it's just sort of like, oh, this place is so beautiful. And when people live here, there's houses and homes and a town. And like, it's, uh, it feels like the Shire. And the Shire has become kind of a code word for that type of uh, ideal place. Um, and a couple places like that where I felt like I'm in the Shire. One of them is uh, Boquete in Panama, up in the mountains. It's a valley, 
<clears throat> in the shadow of a mountain and it's a coffee growing region um and if you're there at a certain time of year it basically is like rainbow season so it's kind of rains a little bit it gets misty the sun comes out and every day at a certain time there's this rainbow or two rainbows that go across the valley you know it's super there in the wet season it's super green there's a home there's like a creek and there's like a waterfall and there's like a cow and a horse and it's uh you know people living there it's quiet you just walk around it's beautiful that's anyway the shire that's one of my uh, favorite worlds so and then on the on the right side here I try to visualize two scenarios where you know you combine these things and <clears throat> and so I have on well, the first scenarios like a, a place like the Shire so like a town in nature and I'm I'm visiting a friend I'm kind of helping him work on a sculpture or installation in his yard like it's his project but I can help him out he needs extra hands or he needs someone with a good eye for color or something so I'm there to help him out this is another group of friends and maybe there's a party tonight, and that's why they're setting up. So that's uh, that's the first scenario. And then uh, the second scenario, I'm by the ocean. I'm kind of alone. I'm in the shade, drinking coffee, and working on a comic. So that's um, yeah, that's another kind of scenario that is <clears throat> I can imagine being really happy with. And so you can kind of see in in the first one a bit of the D double D double dub manifesting, where it's like very um, city or you know human habitation that is closely tied to nature and the people in there are you know making stuff they're like uh their the modes of production are kind of mostly creative and there's no one's really a cog on an assembly line or doing kind of bs paperwork all day trying to you know invent work for themselves they're all making things and and the, and the work is giving them a satisfaction of you know a sense of completion a sense of agency and uh a sense of communality so you can see how the double dub is kind of built towards that so worksheet two um oh actually in no, worksheet three making space for all others uh thinking outside of the self so this this one is um this one is kind of like when you you just have to sort of imagine okay you've, you've you come to this place you sort of imagine these scenarios and then like what about these scenarios might actually infringe on another person's um, or another you know species or just kind of like exploit or just sort of harm something else? Like where where's the potential to harm in your scenario? Because obviously like, you know, any action is gonna have an effect on the world. And of course, like, you know, creation and destruction exist side by side. So you can't avoid destruction, uh, but you can control it or you can direct it or you can manage it. So in the case of my perfect world, let's talk about specifically D double dub. My first uh, desired outcome is like, okay, so I want to create this um, <clears throat> this sort of like uh, um, original herbiome, so or herblet. It's the original herblet in D double dub. So it's like the first kind of experimental prototype for this form of urbanism, which is like the size, the scale of a neighborhood. Um, it's kind of involves like really dense building, you know, covered gardens, exposed gardens, terraced gardens, places, basically where places to grow food and places to kind of create stuff and kind of be social. So, but, you know, to do that on um, set scale of a city is you have to occupy a big stretch of land in Detroit. That's that big stretch of land that runs from like Eastern Market over to Gross Point or something. Um, <clears throat> and there's like a whole neighborhood that, you know, has actually in the in the future vision of Detroit the, t the 2012 kind of plan they kind of identify this neighborhood as having been uh, emptied out already or it's, it's, it's kind of it's like one of the neighborhoods where people have moved away and there's a lot of actual green space there and even some urban farming going on right now um, so of course there's going to be like when you when you think about these uh, scenarios it's a great grand scenario okay so you're gonna you're gonna impose this vision on this existing neighborhood or landscape you got to consider who's there now and you know what is there now and how how do how do we how do we sort of move towards this um this kind of different urbanism uh really kind of built up you know radically technologically advanced situation but how do you accommodate the people who are there or maybe don't want to leave or they're if they're there, been there for a generation or two they're very connected to their plot um so so yeah, that, that's the potential harm. It's like, okay, you want to build this giant thing, 
but uh, you're, just not a, you're not a blank slate. There's people there already. There are things that already exist. So how do you do that? Um, and so, I mean, it, it happens today, but I guess you'd have to think about it on a different time scale in a sense. Like, so if you give yourself like 30 years, you know, to sort of design and plan this thing and just allow that time to happen um, and give the people who live there kind of time to adapt or op options or kind of, you know, ways to, to better their life increase their life, increase their uh, prospects or like just prioritize those people because uh, they're the ones who are going to be directly affected by your actions. And you can do that by, um, you know, giving them long leeway, like say 30 year a window to sort of, you know, figure it out. Or perhaps by then, you know, a generation will have passed and the next generation will be more amenable to change. Um, <clears throat> or even just offer the people who live there kind of the first opportunity to participate and, you know, choose a spot where they're going to live or um, involve them in the process. And this is, uh, yeah, this is common practice, uh, but I'm imagining doing it on like a really large scale that is kind of enabled by uh, future technologies that we don't yet understand. So that's uh, that's that's one thing I did for making space for all others, taking outside the self. I mean, I think a, the second one I did is imagine, okay, I'm going to, I would love to live near the ocean. But what does that mean? Like, you know, uh, am I going to be living on like a, a beach where the sea turtles, you know, nest? No, but, but so it requires, um, it just requires a, a, kind of a sensitivity to context and and um, and kind of knowing what is uh, what is reasonable and what is uh, <clears throat> like what what like you don't. The last thing you want to do is damage. Um, the environment where you're going to be choosing to live like you're choosing to live there because it's sort of it's beautiful so i mean there are a number of ways that you can you can kind of inhabit a beach without ruining the beachfront um i think uh, like a city uh in india in goa uh there's a beach called palolam and there for the most part all the structures are built behind the tree line so you have this gorgeous empty beach that is pretty big and quite long um and then you've got a line of one like palm trees. And then after that is where the hotels and the restaurants are. There are a couple restaurants that have moved forward onto the beach, but they're not very many. So there's like, you might have one at one end of the beach and one at the other end. But the, the way that beach is inhabited is it, it kind of preserves that, uh, the feeling of a, of a, you know, the pristine feeling of an open beach. It's not like some beaches you go to um, and they're built right to the sand and eventually the sand might get washed away so that you're just left with this kind of nasty little last nasty little stretch of beach and then this concrete kind of structure it's it's really kind of an insensitive approach to how you might inhabit a you know a, an environment like that so there, like for every kind of for every decision you make there are, there are ways to mitigate the harm um, that you know that decision might cause and and i i i don't know for the most part i, I think like there's there's a workaround for everything i mean um so yeah so that's that's uh worksheet three making space for all others thinking outside of the self so now worksheet four we have it uh the 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 second the second part of the thought experiment imagine it evolving from the present day i would find find the seeds of the future in the now so for me, I'm thinking about, okay, D double dub, like um, you can see on the, on the right, I've got the vision of the future, which is basically describes the situation I'd, in, in D double dub, an equitable civilization that exists within planetary boundaries, uh, probably, probably will have to be city centric as cities are the most efficient ways for lots of people to inhabit a place. So um, when we look at human habitation and like we, we know we have a certain number of people, like we're not going to people aren't we're not going to cull them they have to live together so cities cities are the solution really um to um kind of living sustainably on this planet on mass and uh so that's that's the vision and then on on the left i've got the contemporary concepts tools and technology so it's this is basically a rundown of how i um of what i posit in deep welcome to d double dub so for my for my concepts tools and technologies i have social media cryptocurrency, donut economics, participatory democracy, universal basic income, and sustainable retreat. So cities, like it's a way of, you know, we're just going to collect and condense our inhabitation to cities um, just to reduce our footprint as a humans. 
So, and then I, um, I scaled it in decades because, you know, this type of change is, you know, we, it just takes, it takes a long time. Like it takes generations. So in this case, maybe, uh, three or four generations. And, uh, I sort of drew it as sort of like a chart where you can get social media and cryptocurrency. So like, say for example, you'd have like a, <clears throat> a way for people to communicate and organize social media and share resources, um, combined with like a cryptocurrency, which is like a, a form of a very secure form of money that, um, like that's, that's totally possible. So, so it's like slowly building up, um, elements of a, of a culture one by one. So you combine those two things and if, and if they're both sort of open and, you know, equitable and they're not driven by a profit motive, they're driven by say like a people motive, then, um, you can kind of, you can use those two things to then create some, you know, the donut economy can then manifest because then you have a way of controlling, not controlling, but monitoring where the money is spent and making decisions about how you spend your money based on um, information about how them, you know, where, what you're buying, where it's coming from, how it affects the, uh, the, what is it in the donut? Is it outside the donut? So between the social media and cryptocurrency, you can kind of, you might be able to, might pre uh, present an opportunity to kind of monitor um, how you're spending your money, you know, and if you make the, you can kind of make the decision to participate in the donut and kind of grow this civilization, this culture that we're, you, you kind of want to manifest. And so, and also as part of that, um, I have donut economics as third, but participatory democracy is also in there too. Like it could be on the same level as the donut economy. So those can imagine that those things can kind of happen pretty quickly. Like um, I've got it like, you know, five years, then 15 years. <clears throat> and um, that's sort of reasonable to think like, uh, given the current situation, we're not moving that much faster than what we are now. And then, and then once you have participatory democracy and then you could develop like a universal basic income. Actually, the basic income would probably even happen sooner. It seems like with this pandemic, um, some countries are moving towards that. They realize um, how uh, how kind of weird, oddly skewed, you know, the balance of power is in the global economic system towards people who already have money, towards the wealthy. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, social democratic governments, say like Canada, are actually considering it as a possibility it doesn't make any it's really hard to comprehend though i think people listen people hear it and they're just like where is this money coming from but what people i think don't understand is that i don't think anyone knows really where the money's coming from like and, and how the economies operate at this point there's so much wealth floating around the world that is sort of detached from uh you know states that and where is it coming from where is it going right now it's just basically being it's, you know, we're turning our earth into like a, a fireball uh, and converting it to money, which is, is just ridiculous anyway. So universal, universal basic income, I think is, um, it's a thing that can happen actually pretty soon, probably even sooner than uh, the donut economics, you know, being instigated. Well, it's all happened simultaneously, I imagine. So I, I sort of drew this. So these are kind of cascading effects, you, you know, one, you know, these two things come together and then this and it, though that forms a thing that then becomes, uh, for, joins with another thing and becomes a thing. And so slowly you're kind of building, you're kind of establishing the foundations of a civilization. And eventually you get to the vision of the future. So, I mean, this is a really rough thing. I kind of threw it together, but it follows, it just kind of outline how I'm imagining uh, Welcome to Deep Double Dub, how I'm imagining kind of the future parfait world to evolve. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, but it can be done kind of with anything like, um, Again, if you're if anyone out there wants to do one of these and they just kind of send it to me, I'd I'd be really interested in seeing what you come up with. Um, <clears throat> just uh, yeah, just would be super cool. And I think it's kind of the type of work that uh, designers have to do or think about. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna get to a point where we're gonna create a world that we all want to live in, that is fair and uh, sustainable. Like this is the type of sort of imagining we have to do. Okay, well, that's the end of it. Um, it's the end of the workshop. I, I really hope you got something out of that. And uh, I hope that you're maybe I've elucidated some of my process uh, about how I came to envisioning this kind of a uh, wacky vision of the future, which I don't think is too far fetched. I mean, 
it really feels to me that it's possible. It just takes kind of a collective will to get there. Um, I feel like it's entirely possible. And I think that what it requires though is for every person, every individual to kind of go through this questioning process about what they want and uh, begin to tr imagine uh, what they want and kind of visualize it. Like, um, you know, the idea of visualization is really important. Like uh, when you think about athletes or, you know, musicians, kind of people who are operating at a very high end in their profession, a lot of them will tell you that uh, they imagine themselves succeeding in whatever task before they start. Like it's, it's part of the part of the process for you know actually succeeding is to imagine yourself succeeding to to see yourself you know clearing that hurdle or that that um, that challenge uh, beforehand is is very important. I mean, you can't take it for granted that's going to happen, but um, seeing yourself through it and over it and how and it enables you to anticipate problems and you know in advance that might come up and and just sort of inhabiting the 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 possibility space ahead of time, um, I think opens up, you know, the actual very real possibility that you might succeed and your dreams may come true. So thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to the Science Gallery Detroit for having me. And uh, I'm going to uh, include uh, on the site, you can download a PDF of the comic and these worksheets. And um, I'll, I'll include a, a list of links of all the stuff I've referenced uh, in the talk as well. So anyway, thanks again for sticking it out. I hope you have a great year and you're happy wherever you are. Okay, bye.